Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chapter 11, Managing Conflict. Previously, we've been discussing what conflict is, as well as some of the styles of conflict. Now, we are going to be discussing how conflict interrelates with interpersonal communication and relationships. Because... Conflict isn't just a matter of individual choice, but it also depends on the relational interactions. Because how do we engage in conflict with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with our bosses, with our boyfriends or girlfriends? So we have to better understand the relationship and that will help us better understand the conflict because relationships can affect our conflicts. So there are four concepts that we're going to be contending with in this section. Complementary and symmetrical conflict, serial arguments, toxic conflict, as well as conflict rituals. Let's dive right in. We start with complementary and supplementary conflict. Complementary conflict is focusing more on using different but mutually reinforcing behaviors. So fight or flight is the most is one of the most com common complementary conflict styles that one person engages in very competitive conflicts. You know, well, you are this, you are that. Why are you not doing this? You should do this. And then the other person, as a result of that fight reaction, they then flight. They run away. This a lot of times happens with um, a um, critical, uh, a, the critical partner continuing to be critical of the other person, and then the other person tries to leave, tries to just uh, isolate, tries to avoid the situation, and the other person then feels like the person does not understand them, and then as a result, it continues to escalate like that. Next, we have symmetrical conflict. This is where both people can use the same tactic. This could be either positive or negative in an escalatory or de-escalatory cycle. So, an escalatory, uh, es escalatory cycle is where one threat leads to another and that they just keep on building and building and building and building. That is not very constructive. De-escalatory cycles are when both, both withdraw, which lowers... Uh, hostility, but also lower satisfaction in the relationship. Instead, what we want to do is we want to strive to communicate positive and empathetic and uh, for uh, collaborative conflict efforts that can then produce the same thing from the other person. By me listening more, it will make it so that they want to listen more. So we can engage in some symmetrical conflict as well. So now we move on to serial arguments. Serial arguments, the cause is that, um, are, sorry, serial arguments are repetitive conflicts about the same issue over and over again. This could be due to problematic behaviors, maybe, uh, you know, is someone uh, continues to uh, steal food from the uh, from the cafeteria, or maybe your relational partner always forgets to put down the toilet seat after they're done. So those sorts of problematic behaviors create these serial arguments. We also have them based on personality characteristics. Maybe there is a specific personality trait of your partner, relational partner, that continues to create serial arguments. I had a friend uh, back in the day that would very much, you know, try to be funny when they weren't and that continued to cause serial arguments about how they shouldn't do that but they continue to want to do that and then lastly we have communication styles and practices communication styles and practices being funny i guess would also be would fall into that category and can cause some serious issues solution is that both partners being equally involved in seeking a solution in that situation where my friend, you know, was thinking he was funny and maybe wasn't, that that would, that by us coming together and working on it, that might have solved the solution, but there was not a lot of listening coming from that relational partner. Also seeking win-win outcomes, things, uh, again, 
showing concern for the other person, showing value for the other person, can reduce a lot of these arguments. The problem-solving method, you know, going through the problem in a systematic way to be, uh, better understand the problem and analyze it to the point where we can reach those win-win outcomes. And then third-party intervention can also be a way of reducing some of these serial arguments. Therapy can be very helpful for many people. Now we talk about toxic conflict, and this speaks to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, as proposed by, jo by John Dotman, criticism, defensiveness, attack, uh, contempt, and stonewalling are these four horsemen, and that they spell the end of days for relationships. In fact, he was able to tell with 95% accuracy which relationships would end in divorce simply by discerning these four horsemen, and they tend to ride together. All of these feed off of, uh, off each other and lead to many problems. Criticism is attacking someone, criticizing them, uh, their partner, without any ta taking any uh, realistic assumption of their own per perception. A lot of you language. Also, defensiveness. Defensiveness is self-devictimizing. Well, I never do that. I'm not, you know, basically by doing that, what that's doing is that's t showing that, you know, I'm practically perfect, but you're defective. So we should take responsibility for our behavior. Also, we have, con uh, even taking a small part of the problem can solve, can start the ball rolling. We also have contempt. Contempt is attacking the other person's self-worth. Uh, instead, describe your own feelings and needs instead of just describing the partner. And stonewalling is just not saying anything. Try not to make things worse. You know, wait until she or he tires themselves out. With this, we should try to do some psychological, uh, sorry, physiological self-soothing, taking a deep breath, that can get us out of that stone walling. Some conflict rituals include, uh, uh, conflict rituals are those rituals that tend to continue to persist. Unacknowledged but very real patterns of interlocking behavior. This is very much what I was talking about with this complementary conflict styles, the fight the flight, the fight, the flight. Those are interlocking behaviors that continue to create these conflict rituals. Now we talk about gender. Gender also interrelates with conflict. Research, ha research has demonstrated that there are some small but measurable differences in gender in how we uh, 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 engage in conflict. Individual style of each communicator, though, is, a more uh, is more of an indicator of how we manage relationship than gender. And heterosexual relationships actually may have a great deal to learn because a lot of conflicts may co result from specific behavior, and those behaviors may be perceived through the lens of gender. Who is supposed to clean the dishes? Who's supposed to go out and work? Who's the, supposed to uh, walk the dog? Who's supposed to take in the groceries? Who's supposed to take care of the child? We have so many ingrained gender roles that, that affect our perception. So it's interesting that in hetero, uh, in homosexual relationships uh, uh, or LGBTQ plus relationships that there are no traditional gender roles. And as a result, we can actually learn a great deal from those groups and how they engage with gender, uh, with uh, conflict. We also have culture. Culture also uh, affects how we orient ourselves towards conflict. Disagreement is either is very acceptable in an, inter in an individual culture, whereas it's to be avoided in a collectivistic culture for the sake of relational harmony. Rapport management. We tend to engage in more rapport management, more uh, preserving the relationship in 
collectivistic cultures, whereas in individual cultures, we don't care all that much about that. You know, hey, if you don't like me, I don't care. I'll be myself. I'm just being me. And then we have preserving face. Is it vital to preserve the dignity of the self and of the other person? If that's the case, you're probably more within the collectivistic culture, whereas in the individualistic culture, we may not care as much about that. Individualistic cultures prefer competing, collectivistic cultures prefer compromising and problem solving, and even sometimes avoiding and accommodating. So, again, we address conflict in many different ways. So, let's put conflict into practice. How should we engage in conflict? Well, first, we should define our needs for ourselves, because sometimes we don't really know what we want. That there's something wrong, we just can't identify what what is wrong. So, we first have to define our needs. Next, share your needs with the other person. This should be done strategically and appropriately and effectively. How do we make it effective? By choosing, choosing a suitable time and place. That addressing the conflict immediately may not be the best solution. Instead, maybe finding a suitable time, but it should not be well after the fact either. Also using I language instead of you language. By doing that, it's showing that I am taking responsibility for my perspective on this and not saying, well, you are doing this. You are that. Then, once you've shared your needs, then listen to the other person's needs and really try to understand what they are coming from. Because the goal of the conflict is to find a win-win scenario. And how can you find a win-win scenario if you do not understand their point of view? Next, generate potential possible solutions, evaluate possible solutions, and choose the best one. This puts out the idea that it's not, that this is a collaborative effort to solve these problems and not just this is the only solution. Worry about what you want to, what, uh, what you want from this situation, not how to get there. That sh how to get there, you should not already have a goal in mind, a, pr a potential policy to put out. Instead, focus on the things that you want and then be flexible with that policy because you could get what you want in a way that maybe you haven't thought of. And then once you have chosen that best one, then implementing the solution is important and staying consistent. Communication needs to be continually occurring throughout the implementation of this potential solution. And then follow up on the solution. Check to see if both of us are still satisfied by this outcome. And that concludes chapter 11, Managing Conflict. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will see you next time.